Hi, I'm Lisa Perna. Welcome to Touch by Prayer. I am so excited because I have Patricia King. We are going to talk about what happens when you have something placed in your heart and God begins to breathe on it. Patricia, thank you so much for coming on Touch by Prayer. It is such an honor. I mean, you have a huge ministry. You've written over 104 books and you have traveled the world. How did all of this start? Because when we were talking yesterday, you kind of said about how God can breathe on our desires. Exactly. Well, actually, God even gives us our desires, doesn't he? You know, they, I believe with all my heart that for the most part, he's the one that puts things inside of us. And then as we identify that, we can partner with him in it. But I was born again um, almost 45 years ago. And it was such a transforming moment. My life was in such a mess and everything was falling apart. I invited the Lord to come in to my heart and immediately I felt the miracle of salvation. All the guilt, all the shame, all the condemnation, the sin issues, I could just feel them literally melt away in his love. So from that moment, all I wanted to do was please him. All I wanted to do was love him. The one who loved me, I wanted to love back. But I noticed that as I walked with him, there would be ideas that would come into my heart. And um, I think we all have those. We have vision that comes into our heart, desires and longings and, and thoughts of things that we can accomplish or create or do. And so I began to identify these. I think, Lord, this is something I know that you would be pleased with. So first of all, we have to give God our yes. I agree with this vision. I agree with this desire. Um, and I'm going to give you my yes, God. But then we have to start moving into it. And as long as the vision is just kept inside of our head, it's actually not going to go anywhere. Or if it's kept inside of our heart, it's not going to be fulfilled. We actually have to start walking forward in it. And sometimes our vision is so big, like I'll give you an example. One of my longings is to see um, modern day uh, slavery annihilated in our lifetime, especially the sex trafficking of children. I just, I just want to see God take it out in our lifetime. That's a dream that I can partner with in God and that he is so pleased to walk with me in. But if I sit back and just wait for that to happen, it's not going to happen on its own because God needs feet on the ground. So it's a bit too big for me to handle right now that whole dream I can't just jump into the end game of it. I have to start with where I'm at. So when we started working with anti-trafficking, it was just a small project. We did an assignment for a two-week school that we did over in Thailand and reached out to the girls. And then when we fulfilled that, God breathed on it, breathed on the testimony that came out of it, but also gave us our next mandate. And then we, we fulfilled that. And then the next one, well, before we knew it, within like three years time, we were right in the middle of, of anti-trafficking um, agendas and relationships and everything had grown and we'd become quite a significant voice. And we stood there thinking, how did we get here? And it was simply by taking that first step and letting God breathe on it. I, I just love that. And, you know, there are so many people who have these desires and they just think, well, if God wants to do it, he's going to open a door. But I love what you said about how we have to be the person who starts to move. And something you actually said was that um, when you are in motion, it's easier to start to do things. So God is looking for that momentum. He will exactly. follow us with that momentum. And even if your direction change, which oftentimes it does, as you move forward, it's like driving a car. You can't steer a parked car. It actually has to be in motion. So as you start moving the car, then the Holy Spirit can say, make a right turn here, make a left turn here, and he will take you to your destination. But if you just sit there and wait to arrive at your destination, you're not going to because there has to be movement. And I think that, that that has been so evident in everything that you've done. I mean, to write 104 books, including your latest book, which is Accessing the Riches of Heaven. And how did that, how did God put that into your heart 
or was that something that you've always kind of pondered? And then when did he start breathing on it? Right. I just want to uh, qualify something too. It's, it's true. I've written 104 books, but not all of those are like um, accessing, which is I wrote it from cover to cover myself. Some of them I have co-written with other authors, mm -hmm. and some of them are like training manuals. But I think it's close to 38 or 39 now that are just like that one where, mm -hmm. I've, where I've done them myself. Some are larger and some are smaller, but yeah, there's. But I didn't actually start writing until I was in my 50s. <laughs> and I was sitting in my kitchen one day and the Holy Spirit said to me, Patricia, I want you to write a book on the third heaven. And I thought, well, Lord, I'm not an author. I never authored a book, never thought of authoring a book. I said, I'm not an author. And he said, but I am. He said, I authored the scriptures. And if you will receive by faith an author's anointing, I will empower you to write. So there I sat in my kitchen and I just said, Holy Spirit, uh, come and fill me with the author's anointing and I received it by faith and Lisa I did not have any feeling there's no sense of any great anointing definitely no lightning bolts were flying out of heaven um, I didn't feel any special oil or empowerment come nothing I just felt nothing but I just accepted it by faith so the next thing I did within the next few seconds is I opened up my computer and I said okay God I'm ready so um, I, of course, have, have been a seasoned speaker for many years. I, I uh, preach, so I've been you know, doing that since um, 1979. And um, so I know how to um, take a message and make it so that people can understand it. And that. So I started writing out an outline, and the outline came so quickly. And then I just filled in the chapters and before I knew it, within two weeks, the book was written and off to the publisher. That's crazy. Yeah, so that was my first book. But then after I finished that one, then the next one was inspired. And that's how it's happened. The Holy Spirit just inspires me. And I'll finish one, and I'll think, oh, good, it's done. And then I might have, like, no inspiration for even months at a time. And then another inspiration will come. As soon as the inspiration comes, I give God my yes. Mm. Okay, God, I will say yes to that, and I begin to work on it. See, and I also think of the scripture, and it says, if I can trust you with the little, I can trust you with the more. And it's like every time that we step out in faith, anytime that we do something in faith, God is saying, okay, if you can do this, then I have more for you. But if you sit, You'll just be waiting for that one thing because God's not going to give you more than you can handle. Right. So he's not going to inundate you with a bunch of dreams if you're not willing to fulfill the one. Right. And he's a daddy. Mm -hmm. So he loves uh, watching his children uh, create. Like when I read my first book now, I'm almost embarrassed in a way because it's, it's, it's like a preschool wrote it, right? I, and, but he delights in it because he saw the heart that was in it. I didn't have a lot of skill back then, but I did the very best I could at the time. And then you develop more and more and more. And I remember one time having a friend of mine who loved to dance before the Lord. And, she, um, and the Lord started teaching her prophetic movement. It was just so sweet. And so you could see just the delight of the Lord towards her. And so one day I said to her, I said, you know, God has given you that desire to dance. And I said, you're naturally gifted, but have you thought of taking uh, lessons? Because you could become very skillful. Mm. And she said, well, I don't want to do that because the, the Holy Spirit's inspiring me. And I said, but he can also inspire you and skill you as well, give you skill. Uh, just like David, uh, he was a skilled musician and he called skilled musicians, but his priority was the anointing and partnering with God. And so she said, oh, I never thought of it like that. So then she went, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to go and get some training and teaching. Well, her dance went to a whole new level. Eventually, she became a dance instructor. Hmm. And so she had the skill and the inspiration, but it was all a partnership with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and, and even back to the vision I told you about the anti-trafficking, one of our uh, first uh, uh, disciples in that came on her first outreach because she had a heart for it. God put the heart in her. But then she ended up moving over to Thailand, living there, 
and getting the skill. Well, now she's got a doctorate in it and she's being used worldwide for major sex trafficking um, initiatives. And it's just amazing how God is using her with her skill, her heart and the anointing. See, and I like that, it's a partnership. So we have to partner with God and that I think is sometimes what makes the difference because sometimes people are so content and so um, headstrong on trying to do it their way. And it's sometimes we have to take that step back and say, you know, daddy, what do you want to do? How do you want to work through this? How can, um, how can I do this better? How can I do it different? So I think that one of the things that that, that woman was saying about being afraid to take instruction is that she was afraid she was going to lose what the father right. wanted to do, but he doesn't take anything away from us. He just adds that's to us. True. So I think that's such a fantastic story. And definitely we have to be led by the spirit when we're looking to grow in our skill and that we want to make sure that when we're getting the training that we need, um, that it is, it is the Holy Spirit that is walking with us in that because I've even heard of people going to Bible school because they had a desire to pastor, they had a, a calling to pastor, and actually ended up coming out of Bible school with very little faith, with less faith than what they started with because the academics of it destroyed some of their faith. So we never want that. Hmm. We always want everything we do to give us more enhancement of the calling. And that's such a, a, a beautiful thing because he always wants to encourage us. He always whispers to us and sings to us mm -hmm. and he uses music for me and he uses television shows. And one of the things that he has shown me, there's um, a cartoon that I used to love as a child, which was Santa Claus was coming to town and it was like an animation, but there's this part where the, the Kris Kringle or Santa Claus is trying to teach someone because he doesn't know how to move. And he says, just put one foot in front of the other. Yeah, and it's so it's good. so simple. Mm -hmm. It's just such a simple thing because even starting, when I started with Touch by Prayer, I didn't know how to do it, but I said, but I'm gonna, I said yes. I just said yes. And when I started to, to do even the conference, I said yes. But God put the people around. God sent me people and yeah, breathed and on as it. As you moved into it, it developed and it got bigger. It got enlarged, right? Like what you're doing with Touch by Prayer now is more seasoned, more enlarged, um, having more impact than it did when it first began. But if you never began, if you never took that st step forward, it would never be there. And I'm just getting a word right now for some of you that are watching that, um, in, in fact, one in particular, you're a bit of a perfectionist, so you actually like to have everything perfect. Every I has to be dotted, every T has to be crossed before you step into something. You need to know what's ahead. And that's a really good virtue, actually, because that's the spirit of excellence. But our strengths have corresponding weaknesses, too. And so the weakness in that is it can hold you back from taking a step forward. So I just want to encourage you to take a step forward and then you can dot your I's and cross your T's as you go. And I think that's such wisdom. I do believe that there are so many people who are sitting, who are frustrated, who just don't know how to start. And I think that um, when you can start to see how God has wired us and he's wired us differently. Mm -hmm. so, so there's so many ministries, but by you being authentically you, by you doing exactly with your personality, with your gifts, with your callings, you're able to do you the best than anybody. Exactly. Nobody else can do you. No one else can do you. And wouldn't it be horrible if we just had a bunch of clones oh, yes. that were cloned <laughs> after another human being? <laughs> you know, it's like, and God would be disappointed. The one who would be disappointed the most would be him because he created us with his beautiful uniqueness. And it's, it, it, it's so wonderful to have that displayed for his glory. And I think that with what we're going through in social media, because you have been doing media and you understand the importance and the impact that media has, there also is a responsibility that we have when we're do, using media, especially to help to encourage people and help to grow. So I think sometimes having the right people or to, to be taught or follow and to pull stuff off mm -hmm. from the, those who have gone before really helps you to understand Absolutely. what is, because why rewrite the book? 
right. right? It doesn't make any sense when you can see somebody and how they journeyed, you can kind of follow and see. That's what makes you a forerunner. Right. So we just kind of run behind. <laughs> Absolutely, like I highly recommend um, seeking out people who have gone the path that you're headed before you um, because they can save you a lot of trouble for one thing, um, you know, because you don't have to make the same mistakes that they did. And usually forerunners, they make the most mistakes because it's uncharted territory. So they're trying to follow the Holy Spirit the best that they can. So they're stepping here and thought, okay, Holy Spirit, that's not quite solid ground. Uh, maybe it's this one, is it this one? But then when they find it, it's like, yes, you know, and then they go the next one. Well, they can prepare the way for you to put your foot in all the right steps as far as they've gone. And then you can go further um, into uncharted territory yourself. But yeah, and these days we have so much available to us. Books, and I mean, you can go on Google and, you know, Google just about anything. Thank God for Google. Because seriously, there have been so many things, especially being a new Christian, I, there were so many things I didn't understand that I had to Google, you know, what is a fivefold ministry? What is, you know, what is it? Who was Deborah at one point? Because I wasn't being a Catholic, it wasn't something that I did. I didn't read the Bible. Mm -hmm. So it was something that was new. And so it was that research because when God gives you something, I believe he also wants you to start researching it. What is it going to look like? What is it going to be? Because he doesn't give you something like you said with the sex trafficking, it started off with something small, but then there was research. There was, there's also a responsibility on our part to right. see, well, what are we getting into? And what are the things that, that I should be aware of when we're navigating these things? When we uh, began our work in anti-trafficking, I mean, it was all new. I'd never even heard of like, you know, um, sex tourism and stuff like that. I'd never, I'd never considered that. And I definitely hadn't considered children being trafficked for sex. It just hadn't crossed my mind, even though we had done a lot of work in the inner city with, you know, uh, prostitutes, mainly those who were drug addicts that were prostituting for their, for their habit, right? But um, the whole concept of sex tourism and that, I, I just, it, it just wasn't in my world. So when God spoke to me, he spoke to me first in prayer. I was in prayer and God spoke to me and he said, I want you to go to Thailand and I'm going to teach you about sex tourism. And I thought, what? You know, and I actually had to go do research before I ever went to Thailand, even though I obeyed the Lord right away, took a friend with me. Um, but as we were preparing, I said, I got to find out what God is speaking about. So even though I was absolutely shocked when I arrived there and got immersed into everything that was going on, and it traumatized me emotionally at first, actually, but I had already done a level of research. But the more we walked in it, the more we learned and understood, so. So Patricia, one of the things that you just said was that God spoke it to you in prayer. I think it's so important sometimes that we go back to that place, that secret place, and we start to pray into things because so many dreams are actually birthed out of that time in prayer. Absolutely, and they're inspired in that place. So there's um, a few places that um, are our source of inspiration or dreams. And of course, one of them is just um, our carnal flesh. The carnal flesh can be pretty good at, at dreaming up things, but um, when it's a carnal desire, it's actually at enmity against God. It'll, it'll have elements in it that don't line up with God. So we don't want that. We don't want to fuel the flesh. We don't want worldly attitudes and stuff like that. The other source, of course, could be demonic. I mean, the, you know, a, a devil could come and, and inspire you with a dark thing. But where we want to land all the time is with God being our inspiration and the source of that. Of that. So where do we get that? It's from communion with him. And we can't bypass that. Because if we do, we can still fulfill a dream. Unsaved people fulfill dreams all the time, but it's not sourced in God. So what we have sourced in God and what we walk through with God, that is gonna stand for all eternity. And that's what we're living for. So when we're in a place of worship and communion with him, and our heart is turned towards him, and we're in the word and we're in prayer, 
that's where the dreams get, get birthed and cultivated. The inspiration comes and it's in partnership with the Lord. And it's so beautiful because then as you start walking each step out with him, it becomes something that is so tangible, but has eternal impact. It's not just feeding someone's flesh or it's not just building something that is going to stand for the world, but not for eternity. It will have eternal quality to it. See, and if we go back to, you were talking about David. And one of the things about David is that when Samuel the prophet called him out and said that this is the dream that God has for you to be king, there was a preparation and there were things that he had to sometimes go through. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. A lot of people during their dreaming process or even in the walking process right. will come up against oppositions. David faced a bear, he fight, faced a lion. Right but that helped to build his strength yeah. and his courage yeah. to stand up against Goliath. So how are some, what are some strategies that we can use as believers and as, right. as sons and daughters right. to help us when we go through times where we feel like our dream is just never going to come to pass? Right. I love what, uh, just the whole point that you're bringing up right now um, because it's called process. And your process is actually more important, your journey is actually more important than arriving at the destination. Um, because if you arrive at the destination too quickly, you could miss some really important uh, growth elements. And years ago, the Lord spoke to me and he said, Patricia, I'm going to make you bread for my body. And I thought, well, Lord, you're the bread of life. And he says, I want to make you bread. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, I didn't understand totally what that meant. But he said, I want to show you what it takes to be made bread. And then he showed me how you put a corn of wheat in the ground. It has to die first and then it falls into the ground. And then it brings forth this wheat stalk, which when it's mature has this beautiful golden head on it and it, you know, the head bows. And it's so beautiful if you go through a wheat, you know, drive by a wheat field, it's so beautiful when it's ready for harvest. But he says, as beautiful as it is, it's not ready for bread yet. And it has to be going, you know, it has to be cut down and then it has to be um, separated. It has to go through a chaffing machine and so that only the head of the wheat remains and then it gets pulverized, it gets, it gets crushed but it's still not ready to be made bread. Then it gets added with other ingredients. And, and I used to make bread a lot and I loved it because I loved the kneading process, especially it just felt good and you could kind of pray as you're kneading. But when you finish the kneading and it's in the bowl, it's just this beautiful squishy lump of dough and it's, it, it, it starts to smell good. You know, the yeast is good. So anyways, then you cover it up and it starts to rise. And that's really fulfilling. I thought, oh, this is so awesome. Look at how beautiful it is. It rises up over the, over the bowl, but then it, get, it has to be punched down to get really good bread. So one punch deflates the whole thing. And I think sometimes in our process, we can relate to, yeah, I feel pulverized, or I feel like, wow, I'm just being crushed and refined like a, a head of wheat would be. And, now then I went through a good season where I felt, you know, other things were being added to me and I'm being mixed together and I'm growing and I've, I mean, I'm this beautiful lump of dough in the hand of God and oh, look at me, I'm rising up and I'm, I'm, I'm growing. But then all of a sudden one thing can punch it down and it can be so disappointing, but it's important for the bread because it gets lighter. Every time it gets punched down and rises, the bread gets lighter. So then it rises up again and it gets punched down and formed into loaves. And that formation is exciting because then you take the, the dough, you put it into the tins and you realize, oh my goodness, now it's gonna start to look like a real loaf of bread. And you let it rise and it rises up beautifully in the tin, but it's still not ready to be eaten. It has to go into a fire then. So then you put it in the fire and how many of us have felt, oh, I'm in the fire and I don't like it, you know? Yeah. And so, but we have to endure the fire because that's when the fragrance comes out. So good. Isn't that's this good? So good. And then yeah. when the fire is finished, when that process is finished, then it gets removed from the oven. The whole house is fragrant. It's kind of like, you know, if you're gonna sell a house, 
just put a fresh loaf of bread in the oven first before your buyers come through and they'll sign on the dotted line for sure because it is, there's nothing better than that fragrance. But it's still not ready to be eaten. It has to be broken open first mm. and served, right? And so there's a series of process that takes place in order to make us ready to be fed to the world, right? So, so that we can feed the world with the beautiful dimensions of who God is. And so every part of the process, the good, the bad, and the ugly, is so important and we need to embrace it. And I think when we, when we can start to see, okay, just like with wine, you know, the same thing, there's a process that wine has to go through in order to get a good right. wine. And sometimes it has to sit. Yeah. And that's- For years and years. For years and years. And sometimes people are like, but Lord, I wanna be used. Am I ever going to be used? But there's that process, it's that patience. And it's right. also that endurance that God is trying to kind exactly. of build in you. Endurance is very important. Yeah, and can you explain like why endurance is so important well, in so many I ways? Well, I find that many people um, get weary in well-doing or in standing in the battle. They get weary and say, you know what, I'm done. But oftentimes they're saying I'm done just before the big breakthrough is there, right? So um, when you look at a mustard seed, Jesus said that if you have faith like a mustard seed, it will bring forth great results. And he's actually talking about the quality of our faith. A mustard seed is the most enduring seed of all. In fact, I have heard that if you were to plant a mustard seed many feet under the ground and put a slab of pavement over the top of it, somehow, some way, that mustard seed would find a way to grow. And if it couldn't break its way through the pavement, it'll work its way around it, but it is going to grow. So if we look at our faith like that and our attachment to what we've given ourselves to God in, and we just endure uh, like a mustard seed, that we will be able to bring great fruit forth for the kingdom of God. And endurance, it actually perfects things within your character also. But I, I also want to point out that while we're waiting for something, it doesn't mean our whole life is on standstill. There's going to be other things that we can put our, our hand to in God that are going to be blessed simultaneously at the same time we're waiting on something else. And I think that's such a good point because God is a multitasker. He doesn't do just one thing. He can do many things. And if we're created in his image, can't he give us many children or many gifts inside of us or many dreams inside of us, exactly. just like children? That yep. was my point. If, if you have a bunch of children, you're able to take care of the bunch, right. not just say, oh, I can only take care of this one. And if that's one of the things you feel like you have a lot of different fires, right. if something needs to sit, you can move to something else and right. start working exactly. on it. So I think that's brilliant. And I think that we need to. It says without vision we perish. And it's true. Um, I have some friends of mine who are in their late 70s and early 80s. And they can outstrip most young people as far as their energy, their workload, all of that. They're just phenomenal. And when I, I look at people like that, I can see a common denominator. And it's like, they just keep moving. You have to keep moving. The moment you stop and lose vision and lose your ability to take the next step forward in life, um, you're, you're going to decay. You're going to uh, spiral down. In fact, there's this wonderful man of God. He just turned 79 and he's being used powerfully by the Lord and has no uh, vision to, to stop, okay? And another friend of mine who's um, gonna be 81 this year, the same thing, just she has no vision to stop. And they are so vibrant, they look young, they've got lots of energy, they're producing for God. But I know of another person who at age 60, her husband died and she shut down all her dreams. She's only 66 now. And she's old, she's unhealthy, she wants to die, she, she can't cope with life, she can barely look after herself. And I think what happened is she just shut everything down. And I just feel like just addressing this with some of you that are watching that if you felt shut down for whatever reason, and some of you might need healing because uh, maybe you were put down or you were broken because of people's treatment towards you, 
God wants to heal that, but he needs you to rise up. It's a rise and shine because your light has come because you will, you will decay, you will spiral down if you do not arise. And so God's saying he's, he's inviting you to arise, put the past behind you and move forward. And I think when we can start to see that there's that scripture, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, right? right? So if you have been so upset about something and you just feel like you've lost your hope, we can always go back to the Father. He, he has a spring yes. of eternal hope. So we don't have to sit in our circumstances. Sometimes we have to stand up and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and right. say, okay, no, I know who my father is. I know who my daddy is. Right. And he has good plans for me. So Another little nugget that the mm -hmm. Lord taught me in life that has to do with this is that he said there is gold in every dark place. And he said, seek out the treasure. Mm. So some of my most painful experiences, and you can probably relate to this also, where you've been mistreated, where you've been put down, where the devil's let you have it, where people have let you have it and everything. When you pull back a little bit and say, okay, God, you're my healer, you're gonna heal me, but I'm not coming out of this time without a, a load full of nuggets. I'm gonna get every treasure of wisdom that I can out of this. And I have found that those times have taught me more about love and truth and given me insight. And the Lord spoke to me years ago and he said, anything you face in life that's contrary can be a stepping stone or a stumbling block hmm. to you, depending on how you perceive it, depending on your perception of it. And so I always like to look at everything as a stepping stone. In fact, I'll say to the devil, devil, you'll be sorry you ever tried. Oh, come on. You know, <laughs> I make him hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, if he's going to harass me or, you know, try to take me down, he'll be sorry because I'm just going to use it to take me and others to the next level. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do. I mean, we have the authority and that's what this book is about. It's about our authority that we do not have to live a life where we're right. constantly feeling like the victim. Yep. We are clearly because of Jesus Christ, the victor. Yep. And so that perspective is so important. It's so important. And I love this book, Accessing the Riches of Heaven, uh, because Jesus actually told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's not like living through our life, just going through the motions in earth and then going to heaven one day. No, it's actually about living in heavenly blessing and glory now while we're living in the earth. So the book teaches you how to access the blessings, how to access heaven's atmosphere, how to ascend, how to descend, and how to live a victorious life in the earth as you would in heaven. And isn't that, by accessing the riches, isn't that going to help us fulfill those dreams, help to fulfill those callings, right. where we understand who we are and where we are seated, that we don't ever have to think, well, do we think, or is God gonna provide? Because he says, where, I, where he guides, he provides. And so exactly. we just have to get into that same mindset as what he has. And the riches of heaven isn't um, about money, although God can give us money. He Absolutely. has no problem yeah. giving it to us, but it's just an earthly currency. It's very fickle. It'll have value one moment, not the next. I mean, whole nation's currencies collapse overnight. So, I mean, you can't put your trust in it. You won't find it in heaven. But there's the riches of wisdom. Anytime we need wisdom, God says he'll give it to us generously. And it says in the Bible that wisdom is the principal thing. So in wisdom's left hand are riches and honor. In wisdom's right hand is life, right? So it's like just in that one, one heavenly rich riches of wisdom, his riches of wisdom, in that one aspect, we can be loaded with benefit in life. But we've got health, we've got strength, we've got vitality, uh, we've got love, peace, everything that you could possibly think of, of what you need to live in victory in life is available to us. It's, it's, it's every single blessing is available to us. And all we have to do is learn how to download it. And faith is a connector to that. And I think that 
as we start to increase our faith, as we start to step into those things and we see how God, oh, he did that. And like you were saying, it's not so much about the finances, but sometimes it's about open doors. Right. Sometimes it's about connection, right. getting connected with the right people. Sometimes it's just an opportunity that presents itself that you're like, oh my goodness, how did that happen? Right. And when we see those things, those are some of the, um, the benefits. I call yeah. it the ben being a benefactor yeah, exactly. <laughs> of heaven. That God is saying, no, 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 don't you understand that I can get to anyone. I can get to anyone. You just go when I tell you to go. Yeah, because that exactly. was one of the things he said to me. Mm -hmm. And so when we start to operate with that mindset, mm -hmm. I think that things kind of change. Right, and all of the riches of heaven are ours. So when we start understanding this, they just start following us. Jesus said, you follow me and the blessings will follow you. He said, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all the things that the Gentiles eagerly seek just get added to you. So all the earthly riches get added to us when we seek him and the heavenly riches. Come on, that's a good word yeah. right there. That's a good word because this is the father's heart. His heart is for us. He has it written in the book. He has our dreams. He has the things that he wants for us. And don't you want to finish your race and, and see exactly. every single thing that he had? You're like, oh, I did that. Oh, I did that. Oh, I mm -hmm. did that. And it's never going to be something that you're not going to be able to fulfill. Because if he wrote it down, even yeah. before the foundations of time, mm -hmm. don't you think that he's going to help you get it done? Absolutely. In the book, there's a section that everyone really loves, and it's called the four realms of abundance. Yes, and I love it. And we teach on yes. how to access it, yes. right? And I just feel to, to just bless our viewers today with um, declaring over you the opening of four realms of abundance, that you will reap what you sow, that you will be blessed, that's number two, that you will be rich, and that you'll be wealthy. And that is what God wants for you. And again, you know, not confined to how the world sees it, because the world measures rich and wealth and that according to, to dollar uh, figures. And it's not like that in the heavenly, but you do get an addition, multiplication, increase of everything in life, including finance. Mm -hmm. See, and I think joy is one of the riches that mm -hmm. we should walk Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Because we, we were talking yesterday, we were out, um, we were talking about how the dogs seem so healthy. Right. And you were saying, you know, that they're all so healthy and it really is a joy factor. As we, it says the joy right. of the Lord is our strength. So I think as we start to understand that joy is actually a weapon from yes. God. Yeah. It's not something like, oh, I'm happy. It's not a feeling, but it's a place. It's a posture yeah. that we know that he's laughing. He's right. in delight. And you can choose joy. Like you can choose sadness or joy. Like any circumstance will give you an invitation to be sad, to be mad, or to mm. be glad, right? Mm. So you get to choose how you are going to respond to the situation. So the Bible teaches us to set our mind on those things that are good and lovely and of good report. And of course that produces joy. As, as soon as you turn your heart toward Jesus, it'll produce joy. But I loved what you said yesterday when we were out. And you know, I've been uh, meditating on it since because you said to be happy is to be healthy. And it is true. The Bible actually says that. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So it's our emotional strength, our spiritual strength, and our physical strength as well. And it's true, like when we look at happy people, joyous people, they're healthy, they're strong, they, they have a skip to their step in life, um, everything comes up roses, they attract more joy. It's a beautiful thing. See, that's where I think the church has kind of missed it. We kind of think that we have to stay in this place of solemn, like, okay, and that I believe is one of the, the biggest misunderstandings. When we think about Jesus' life, there are so many people who think, well, he just, you know, he went around. But honestly, would you go and follow a man who was miserable? Mm -hmm. He must have been the happiest. He was happy. He must have been so happy. And who would not want to be with someone who right. just exuded this joy, who just was filled with life to the abundance, to right. overflowing? And as his sons and as his daughters, that I believe is one of our responsibilities. Right. We have to look different than the world. You find that um, anxiety and stress, it, it actually weighs you down. 
it, it, it takes your strength away, whereas joy adds strength. But obviously there's times when we're not gonna be exuding joy. Like if you're you know, trying to comfort someone who's lost a loved one, you're not gonna go into a funeral, let's say, and start you know, exuding yeah. joy. I yeah. mean, that would be inappropriate. We were yesterday at a site where a lot of people had lost their lives. And I actually took a, had a picture taken at that site and I asked for it to be taken again because I was smiley, smiley in the picture. And I thought, this isn't an appropriate emotion. So there, there are times when we weep with those who weep and we identify, but our strength comes from being reminded of the joy of the Lord. And I remember years ago when I was taken up into a sovereign heavenly encounter, all of heaven was laughing. And I was actually a little bit offended by it at the time because I thought, we are facing really heavy issues in planet Earth. And you guys are having a party up here. We could really use your help sort of thing. I had that kind of a, a thought go through my mind. And the Lord spoke to me and said, we don't have any stress, any anxiety up here at all because we live in what's already been finished. Come on. Isn't that awesome? That is. And, and so it, it's like he wants us to live from that perspective too. And I think, as we said before, joy is not an emotion. Mm -hmm. It's a state. Mm -hmm. It's knowing that God is not worried. He's not upset. He's right. not concerned. Well, he, he's concerned, but not in the way that we right. are. Right. Like his love for us is this unending just uh, flow of just, I want the best for you. Come on, you can mm -hmm. do this. You can write that book. You can write that play. Yeah. You can produce that show. There are so many things, you know, you can open that business. Because some people think, oh, well, if it's not ministry, then it can't be from God. But mm -hmm. there are so many things that God wants to do. And it's really, it's up to the children, his children, to start establishing things. Because right. we can be the game changers. Right. We can take a place in media, in business, in government, and in education, in all these places for his glory. Because we're not confined. Our ministry is not confined within the church. We are the church and we are filling the earth with kingdom advancement because we're kingdom ambassadors. So it's a powerful day that we're living in. Absolutely, and this is just, this is just the beginning of what's to come. Mm -hmm. This is just the beginning. And I think that as we um, wrap this up, I think that there is um, just something that, if you wouldn't mind just praying to the audience and just kind of sharing your heart of, of letting them go to break off that fear, mm -hmm. to break off those hindrances yeah. that have had people stuck. Yeah, I would love to, because God believes in you and he has, he has such expectation for your life. And no matter what anyone has said that has put you down or told you you couldn't do something, remember his voice trumps every other voice. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I break the power of every hindrance in Jesus' name. We just break those off of you and we clear the airwaves, so, so to speak, over your life. And we release the blessing of the Lord for you to arise in this hour and to fulfill everything that God has called you to do and be. Blessings to you. Patricia, this has been such a special time and I just thank you so much for, for sitting here and for sharing your heart, for just letting um, our viewers know that when God is breathing, that it's time to start moving. Yeah, I think that is awesome. It's been my honor, thank oh, you. Oh, this is so wonderful. Thank you guys for watching. I hope this has blessed you. I hope that you can feel God breathing on your circumstances because he has a dream place just for you. Thanks for watching, God bless.